Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Experience Kills. I'm your host Ben and with me today is Richard. Hello, I'm in a funny mood today. Sorry. When is <laughs> Richard not silly. in a funny mood? <laughs> <laughs> this, can, this might get silly, perhaps one of the most overtly stressful and tense gaming experiences we're going to talk about right now. But, you know, Richard's bringing the fun to... That's how we're going to deal with it. That's how we'll get through this. Come on. Sunless Sea, Submariner Edition, out now on Xbox after being out for about five years on PC and a couple of years on PlayStation 4. It's coming out to Nintendo Switch as well, uh, but I have been playing it on the Xbox One. Uh, yeah, do you know anything about Sunless Sea? It's been around a while. So... Um... Uh, well, I'm not going to lie. No, I don't. Oh, <laughs> apart wow, from, okay. Uh, apart from what you've told me about it and from what I've looked at before we started chatting today. So I've had a quick scoot around to see what it's about. I've got a rough idea, but mm. I'm basically um, a noob to it. So so I'm not going to probably... I always say this when, when we do ports. I'm not going to spend too much time you know, getting into the minute show of the game. And then I do, so I probably shouldn't say that. But... Uh, basically, Sunless Sea is, well, back in 2015, was a Kickstarter game on PC that span off from a free browser game called Fallen London, made by Fail Better Games. And uh, yeah, this this game was hugely well received back in 2015. Critical um, reception was nines and tens all over the board. Basically. It, you know, it was lauded as a triumph of indie game greatness at the time. And guess what? It's not really changed. Um, if anything, we've got included in the Submariner edition here on Xbox, we have the DLC, which included a uh, sort of submarine option. Uh, so that's now part of Sunless Sea on Xbox. And it's still that great game. It's basically a survival slash exploration role-playing game with roguelike elements so uh, it's quite hard you're gonna die you're gonna fail you're gonna start again but every run you do you're gonna get more familiar with the world and the systems and get a bit further than the one before uh, and basically it really encourages you to be bold to be brave and to get out there and explain explore the the interverse i think is what it's called let me just check that actually it's got a strange name it's basically London has like fallen into the depths of a sort of eldritch Stygian nightmare and you're down there trying to survive basically insanity. Does this sound like your kind of game, Richard? How are you feeling about this? It does look like my sort of game. It's very Lovecraftian, isn't it? So it, isn't it like based on the back of a giant beast or something like that? So like you're sailing across the beast? Oh, so not the... Un not the Unterverse, the Untersea, which is the, the undersea uh, of... Yeah of the universe are you in the back of a giant beast i couldn't yeah. say i don't i haven't found that did you find that in some kind of like law somewhere when you were doing your research into this earlier? i was looking, looking for trailers and stuff and it mm. makes out like you're um sailing across the back of this huge creature or something i don't know but wow, it that sounds scary. cool what? yeah well it looks scary whatever it is so even the stuff that you can see that's you know to scale with your little boat is terrifying so when you say it encourages you to be bold don't really does it because it's <laughs> saying if, if you edge past the um, two feet in front of you that you can see with your ship's little light there's something awful going to come out of you like a giant worm or some tentacled creature and it looks awful <laughs> <laughs> so when i say encourage you to be bold there is a literal tutorial tips that say be bold Okay. And, and go out when I say encourage you it's literally the developer saying honestly do go out there and sail because otherwise you're not going to get anywhere with this game and that's very true it's like yeah if you stay close to fallen London itself you can you know do a bit of like exploration a little bit of trading and stuff but you really need to to push out and you have these three basically depleting well two depleting and one increasing meter so you have supplies uh, and you have fuel and basically you're always balancing that because yeah you could very easily get stranded out in the ocean and starve to death when you run out of fuel that's decidedly possible and that's happened to me more than once uh, in addition, you have your sanity meter, like your terror bar. And if that goes too high, yeah, your crew is going to go mad and kill each other. 
Um, so that's not great. Uh, <laughs> that's what we want to avoid that. One of the options, if you run out of supplies, by the way, is you can turn to cannibalism and start eating each other to uh, to try and get through uh, back to base. You know, that's that's a valid option for you in many cases. Uh, but basically, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it puts that as a selling point in the trailer that I saw. It's just flashes up on screen. Eat your crew. Oh yes, please. <laughs> Jimmy the bosun's looking really tasty right now. I'm going to get me a bit of that leg. Nice. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, the the main thrust of the game, which I don't think I remembered because I played this game five years ago on PC, uh, but the main thrust of the game isn't so much navig- navigating around the sea with your boat. It's much more about uh, the text, the reading, the narrative. Uh, that will take you through the story beats that will have you uh, talk to your crew and get to know your officers better and stuff like that. But basically, you're, it's more like a choose your own adventure text adventure than it is a kind of action based um, RPG. So you're going to be doing lots and lots of reading. And the most important thing I want to stress here is this is a console port and the text is nice and big. So you can read very easily on your TV, 10 plus feet away, uh, to the point where it actually makes the interface a bit clunky, the text being as big as it is, because it's kind of like fills the UI in places. Um, oh. the, it, yeah, not the best when it comes to visual representation, but it's a trade-off I'm happy that because they've just basically, you know, select all the four points larger on the text so that you can <laughs> you can read it nicer um so that means that the, the ui means a bit more scrolling and it definitely occludes the main game screen a lot even when you're navigating you've got like a a notification box in the bottom left which mm. fills up a good portion of the screen you've got these officer portraits across the top and towards the right that fills up a big portion of the screen uh, so you've you've basically got icons everywhere so the actual kind of viewable area for navigation is even smaller uh, in many ways than you know what you may have seen in the trailers for the PC version uh, and that's not the end of the world because you move at a very slow deliberate pace in this game even at full speed your ship basically plods along and it's very much a, a case of trying to build tension of building dread you know as the further you get away from london the higher the insanity reach it goes up and the, and the more you watch those other supplies and fuel bars tick down you know that that fear of will i make it to another island will i find somewhere else to land so i can sell some cargo and so i can get some more supplies so i can move on to the next thing or will i just be stranded or will i be attacked by a ginormous sea creature um so that that, that engages the combat element of the game which is serviceable it's clearly not where the love of the experience comes from it's fine uh, as you progress further through the game you can upgrade your ship and get more weapons and stuff so that gives it a bit more variety but basically it's icons on a cooldown which you then trigger uh, pulling the left trigger as long as they're within the firing arc of the, the weapon on the deck or whatever kind of uh, weapon you're using at the time and yes things get better and therefore more effective in combat you do find an upgrade quite considerably your arsenal but it's it's just not the reason you're doing this honestly I can't stress enough this came from a free browser game which was a text adventure so at its heart the quality of this game by fail bear is in the writing and it is so much fun it's dark it's twisted it's humorous like really funny at times and like surreal and weird and and it's kind of like lovecraft with lovecraftian without the horrible um racism and like just myopic depression so it's it's got a levity to it as well as a darkness and it balances it really well so just bear that in mind going in there's no voice acting you are reading constantly in this game you will spend more time reading than doing anything else and that's not gonna be for everyone but if you want to get immersed into like a really properly narrative almost like reading a book type experience then you're gonna have a lot of fun um, with Sunless Sea. Rich, have you got any questions or thoughts or anything you'd like me to delve into a little bit more? Yeah, because it's such a horror-based thing. What's the sound design like? You've not covered the sound yet. There's some music. That's it. Okay. There's some music. The music's fine. It's not many tracks. They don't repeat that often. There's actually quite a lot of silence I've noticed in this game, and that's mm. definitely intentional. You know, when you're sailing across, you maybe hear a little bit of a chug of the engine. You know, there's the odd boy. Ding! Ding in the distance, oh, nice. you know that that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So it doesn't you know, do it. 
No, it, it's minimal, but very intentionally minimal, I think. And it's and therefore, when something bursts out of the sea in front of you or whatever, or you're attacked by a creature, and you know that that kind of sells the the terror and the suddenness of it uh, very effectively. Um, I I think this game is maybe a strange thing to be on a console but it works like the port works and it's cool that more people are able to try it um like i mentioned you said it's beginning. coming to switch as well right yes so you've got to wonder how that text issue works there it must be really hard to balance that across so many different form factors but yeah what's, I, what's the best way to play this then pc i would say pc because you're sat right in front of the screen you know you, you know it, it there's a lot of the the way you interact within the, the the text adventure elements is very much like these little click boxes which is clearly designed with a mouse and keyboard in mind you know just click you know very easy but this you know you're scrolling down with the stick and you know it will highlight the box and you hit a it's not a problem it works um it's just th there's been very little kind of thought of this game you know on console it definitely wasn't developed for a console and that's that's not a problem the way the ship controls for example i think would have been just a, a general kind of click you know on the screen makes it move in that direction if i remember correctly um mm -hmm. in this you have direct control over the orientation of the vessel using the stick so you're moving it like you know uh, turning left on the stick will make it steer left it's not like a twin stick shooter where the direction you point the stick in is the direction the vessel will go in you need to always think of the orientation of the ship. So if you're going up, left is left. If you're going down, left is right. So you need to consider that when maneuvering um, because there's no change in the camera perspective. So that's always fixed above. So again, not developed with a console in mind, not developed with direct input in mind for controls. If you think about how that would work with a mouse, it would be far more intuitive. You're just clicking you know, where you want it to turn to. Um, speed control is all on the D-pad, so like up on the D-pad will move you to like up and down the speed, and then you know down on the D-pad moves you down. It's very very simplistic. And then like I said, attack is on the left trigger. There's there's not a lot going on. It, the pace of the game means while those control configurations could have been annoying in a speedier game, at the speed you're mostly moving in this, it's not a problem. It really isn't. Um, I found myself, you know, engaging enemies and then sticking it in reverse and kiting them, keeping it at the extreme uh, distance of my targeting reticle so I could, like, give myself a chance to, like, recharge my weapon and stuff. Quite easy to do. Wasn't a problem. Um, yeah, it's so, yeah. Anything else you'd like to know about that sort of thing? Control or presentation? No, but it's, um, it's certainly one I'm interested in playing because I do love that Lovecraftian theme. And it works so well in all sorts of different genres, doesn't it? So we've yeah. seen it fairly recently in sort of an FPS sort of format but having this top-down isolationist sort of perspective on uh, empty dark world um, yeah I'd be up for that yeah I mean that's the strength of this game the strength is 100% the exploration the writing and the tone uh, you truly feel the oppressive weight of this fallen London, of this. Uh, <laughs> I love the I love the term Unterzee, um, which is all around you and is just darkness. It's always nighttime in fallen London. There's never any break to this oppressiveness, this constant um, sense of dread, of, of the unknown, of the eldritch horrors, uh, you know, coming out of the Stygian abyss and just pulling you under into their gaping black moors. A little bit. Yeah. I love that shit. That shit's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. It's so much fun to play. Um, but yeah, I, I I think I'm glad, you know, it's on the Xbox now, two years later on the PlayStation 4 for some reason. Uh, who knows why that is. Also, you can have it on the Switch, on the go, on the Nintendo handheld uh, version if you wanted to, or play it docked and stuff. I'd be curious to see how well, like you said, the text um, comes across on the handheld. But I suspect, looking at this version on Xbox, the text is big. I, I don't think it'll be a problem in handheld on the Switch, personally. I think you'll be able to read that fine. And if they've also included touchscreen integration, that would be really cool. But I do not know uh, about that particular edition. Most of the time with ports like that, they don't. So who knows? Um, yeah, so that's another episode of Experience Skills. I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening and watching our review of Sunless Sea Submariner Edition on the Xbox. Uh, it's out right now uh, on the console, so please check it out on all platforms now. You basically can get this anywhere. It's definitely a recommend from me. It's a very, very well put together game. Uh, you can obviously follow us on 
Experience Kills on Twitter for more information uh, about you know what we're covering and news and you know whatever else might be happening in the video game sphere. You can find me at DIYE. You can find Richard at Colonel Red. We have a website now as well if you want to check that out at www.experiencekills.co.uk. Uh, and please give us a like and subscribe on YouTube. It really helps get our uh, stuff out there. That's all we ask. No Patreons, no paywalls, no nothing like that, and no adverts. So uh, a like and subscribe, please. That mean the world to us, wouldn't it, Rich? I would love that. Please love us. Please. Please love us. It's it's the gratification we require. Thank you very much. Yes. Or we'll pull you into the Stygian Abyss. So until next time, keep sailing. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>